We all make mistakes, sometimes more often than we care to admit. You may have been a ham for so long that you probably can't remember, or don't care to remember, what it was like to be a newbie. My rookie days are much more recent, so my mistakes as an inexperienced ham are still all too painfully clear. I made so many mistakes during my first year as a licensed ham that I had enough to create a top 10 list. And who knows, maybe there are still some rookies out there that might benefit from my embarrassment. So here goes, my top 10 ham radio rookie mistakes. Let me know if you can relate to any of these. Or if you must, just laugh at me in the comments. Coax cable is a whole conversation unto itself. As a newbie, I had no idea what coax to use. I knew I had a ton of coax from cable TV applications, but fortunately for me, the connectors are completely different, so I suspected correctly that I should buy new. See, they have us newbies in mind. So I knew that I needed 50 ohm cable, but wasn't prepared for the fact that there were so many varieties available. Do I get RG58? RG8X, RG8U, something else entirely. I was not about to make another newbie mistake, so I went to a local radio and electronics store that had been in business for like a hundred years. This was a good idea by intent, but still turned out to be a mistake. The only coax I could find was RG58, and it was fairly expensive. So that means it must be good stuff, right? I asked the owner what the best type of coax was for ham radio use, and it was no surprise to me that he claimed it was RG58. I will go out on a limb here and guess that the fact that it was the only cable he had in stock might have influenced his recommendation. Now RG58 will work, but the keys to understanding coaxial cable are signal loss and power rating. The RG58 is thinner and is meant for short distances and lower power. RG8U is best for very long runs and higher power, such as professional and tower usage. But of course, it's much more expensive. The RG8X works great for me because my roof antenna is less than 50 feet away from my radio. If you need coax and you're running low to mid power, Check out www.wiredco.com for some bargains. They also carry adapters, jumpers, PL259s, SO239s, and a few other common radio accessories at a nice discount that you normally won't see outside of a ham fest. I love using digital modes. The ability to integrate a computer background with amateur radio was one of the things that made the jump into this hobby more comfortable and exciting for me. This lesson is not about making a mistake by trying to save a few bucks. Instead, this one is about making a costly mistake, costly here in terms of time, energy, and frustration, by being complacent and overconfident, or just by overlooking the simplest of solutions. I was eager to try out the new FT8 mode that everyone was talking about. I downloaded the free WSJTX software program and configured my radio to communicate with it. It seemed pretty straightforward and intuitive, yet I couldn't get the radio to cooperate. It seemed that nobody could hear me. I read tutorials and watched videos on the configuration and setup process, wondering what I could have overlooked. Nothing jumped out at me. My connection just didn't work like everyone else's did. I had several friends look over my configuration in disbelief that theirs worked with the same radio as I had, but mine didn't.
I even re-downloaded and reinstalled the program a couple of different times, to no avail. I went months not being able to play in this fun digital playground, until I realized I never downloaded the USB driver for my radio. All along I had assumed I did, and wouldn't even accept the possibility that I could have overlooked that most basic step. Or perhaps I did download it all those months ago, and the file was just corrupt. But I never explored the basic option of reinstalling the driver, until I was absolutely desperate and had lost months of possible contacts. One thing that took me by surprise and completely overwhelmed me during my first year as a licensed amateur radio operator was the sheer volume of radio groups, clubs, organizations, field events, educational opportunities, contests, operating modes, gatherings, DIY projects, license upgrades, travel, and other exciting activities that were available to participate in. Everything was on the table and it all sounded like so much fun. Oh, those were the days. I was eager to do it all. I joined several local clubs, attended all the club functions and meetings, and volunteered at special events, signed up to be part of the Aries Races group, and started taking all the required training for that. I signed up for a weekly class to learn CW, started a YouTube channel, traveled to as many ham fests as I could, and I attended every training opportunity that was available through my clubs. I'm sure there's other hams who can relate to the fact that I needed a separate calendar just to keep track of all my ham activities. Needless to say, you can't do everything all at once and still be in the process of building your shack and learning to operate your equipment. I took a deep breath and stopped to realize that many of the hams around me have had 50 plus years in the hobby to accumulate their knowledge, experience, equipment, and confident that I lack in comparison to my minimal time as a licensed ham. I'll try to take this into consideration the next time I start to feel that I'm not as far advanced yet into the hobby as I want to be. It all takes time, and it's good to know that there will always be goals on the horizon to keep things fresh and exciting. A valuable lesson I learned was that I feel more enriched as a ham by focusing more energy on fewer things at one time. Give new skills, like CW, the time and focus they deserve to develop, and they will in turn reward you with valuable experience to enhance your hobby and to help others do the same. Well, here's one mistake that's still in the making, and has the potential to be the worst. Judging from my record, there's always room for another learning experience. A couple of years ago when I bought my first HF rig, an ICOM IC7300, I set out to properly ground it with no, well, maybe minimal, shortcuts. I bought a six-foot copper grounding rod and hardware to attach a copper cable to. It seemingly rained the entire spring and into the summer. When it finally stopped raining, I selected a spot in the yard not too far from the shack, and expecting a hassle getting it into the ground, I borrowed a sledgehammer from my neighbor. Firstly, I tried to push it into the ground as far as I could before using the sledgehammer. It kept going in farther, so I kept pushing. In fact, it slid into the moist ground so easily that I was able to push it in all the way with my bare hands. I was very impressed with my strength. It looked like I would only need the help of a hammer to pound the last foot or so in since my leveraging advantage was now lost. I took the sledgehammer and gave it a whack. In an instant of regret, the copper rod disappeared under the surface of the dirt. Have you ever tried to pull six feet of grounding rod back out of the ground? I don't yet know of any tools that can help with this. The rod has now truly become part of the ground, and to this date my radio remains ungrounded. 
I expect I can dig a hole around the rod to connect my cables, you know, someday when I get a chance. Recently, I added a VHF UHF rig to the shack, the IC9700, with the intent to ground the whole system during that first chance I get. Meanwhile, I'm hoping I can eke out another winter with an ungrounded station, and that this will not become the mistake that ends my ham radio hobby. But then I'll need some good stories for a future video, right? Well, stay tuned.